Hello and welcome back to another lecture on syntax. In our previous lecture, we repeatedly referred to the word rules. What do we mean by rules? In this lecture, we tackle that question. Stay tuned. So let's go back to these rules now. Where did these rules come from? Recall that we said that syntax was a scientific study. Being a scientific study, it makes use of the scientific method in studying language. The scientific method involves a few steps. First, we observe the available data that we have. Out of this data, we come up with generalizations. Next, we develop a hypothesis to test. And then we test this hypothesis using more data. So then we go ahead and we do this all over again. We get new data and then we observe the data and go back down the list. Again, this is the scientific method. Now these hypotheses that we come up with can be considered the rules of the language. And these rules are tested again and again until they become more powerful rules. So let's take an example of how we use the scientific method. An anaphor, quite simply, is a pronoun plus the suffix self. Examples are himself and herself. So let's pretend that we want to find out what the rules of anaphors are in the minds of a native speaker. And let's also pretend that we don't know anything about English so far. So we'll look at some data from English. We notice that it is fine to say that John likes himself. It is also fine to say that Mary likes herself. But it's not fine to say that John likes herself. This sentence is ungrammatical. It is also ungrammatical to say that Mary likes himself. This is also ungrammatical. So here's the data that we observed. The next step is to make a generalization. The generalization that we can come up with here is that herself, or I'm sorry, the anaphor, must agree in gender with an antecedent. An antecedent is the phrase or the person that the anaphor refers back to. So since John is male, himself must also be the masculine version of an anaphor. Since Mary is female, this must be the feminine version of the anaphor. Fine. So now we come up with a generalization that says an anaphor must agree in gender with an antecedent. That would explain why John likes himself is fine, but John likes herself is not. So, so far we developed a hypothesis, really. But now we need to get some more data and test again. So let's add a bit more data. Now this was a grammatical sentence. I can change one thing and make the sentence ungrammatical. Likes himself. That's bad. Likes herself is also bad. So now we come up with a new gener generalization that this antecedent that we were looking at here is a must. This is not optional. So we go back to our hypothesis. An anaphor must agree in gender with an antecedent. We change this, we say with its antecedent. That means that there should or must be an antecedent there. So this is our new version so far of our hypothesis. It must have an antecedent and it must agree with the antecedent in gender. Now take some more sets of data. John likes himself. Mary likes herself. John and Mary like himself. That's bad. John and Mary like herself is bad. But John and Mary like themselves is good. So now we go back and modify our hypothesis one more time that it must not only agree in gender, but also in number as well with with the antecedent. So this is a singular antecedent, himself is singular. Mary is singular, herself is singular. John and Mary is plural. This is singular, so they don't agree, and that's why it is ungrammatical. John and Mary here is plural, themselves is plural, so this sentence is fine. Now that should be enough as an example of how the scientific method is done. But as you can see, we came up with hypotheses. These hypotheses are the rules 
of the language that we are looking for. And if you recall, we said that these are the descriptive rules. We are not interested in prescriptive rules, only the descriptive rules. So, so far we've been talking about gathering data and observing and making generalizations from these data. But what are the sources of the data? Where do we get this from? Well, there are two main sources. First, we can look at corpora. Now, corpora is like a collection of things that contain natural language or language used by humans. So, for example, you could look at a collection of newspapers, say, from 1900 to 2000, a span of 100 years, and use the information here to find out about the rules that govern anaphores. But there's a problem with only relying on corpora. The problem is that sometimes they under or over generate. What does that mean? If the rules would come up, come up with under generate, that means they are too broad to be able to explain everything. If they over generate, that means they are too strict and they might label as ungrammatical things that should be grammatical. This happens just because, even if we are looking at newspapers spanning 100 years, this entire time, we might just have a case of bad luck and never ever encounter one sentence where there's a problem of the anaphore not agreeing with its antecedent in number, for example. If that's the case, then how are we going to come up with a rule that includes in it that we must have our anaphore agree in number with its antecedent. That will never happen if we haven't seen it in the corpora. The second way is the most reliable way. We want to look at the competence of the native speaker. So we want to know what the native speaker has in his mind. Well, why don't we just ask the native speaker? So we can come up with a potential list of data and ask the native speaker to judge. The native speaker might say, yes, this one sounds fine to me. The other sentence sounds ungrammatical. This one also sounds ungrammatical, and this one sounds fine. Out of these, we can come up with the rules that directly describe what the native speaker has in his or her mind. And note that the native speaker can't actually give me these rules, but I can deduce these rules from these judgment tasks. In particular, we call these acceptability judgments. This is where the native speaker judges whether a certain sentence is acceptable as grammatical language or not. And you might imagine here that we have to ask more than one native speaker. We cannot rely just on data from one source. So the most reliable source, as we said, were the acceptability judgments of native speakers. So now that we've talked about what syntax is, where it fits in linguistics, where rules come from, the sources of data, and the general picture of syntax, we can move on ahead to our second lecture and talk about some more details inside the syntax. See you there.